Welcome back to Alumni Bearcat Chats and a pleasure to be joined by Maggie Chan Jones. She is the CEO and founder of Tenshi and a proud Binghamton University alumna from 1996. Maggie, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jacob. It's great to be here. Of course. Let's start, um, and we'll get into Tenshi in a moment, but sure. you've said you had reached your North Star when you were at SAP as the Chief Marketing Officer. Having reached that North Star, what led you to say, wait a minute, I want to create something new? Yeah, absolutely. You know, for me in my career journey, one of the things that has always been constant is how do I help the next generation leaders to grow? Because we will, I personally really believe that in order for any organizations to grow, you need to have the best talents and you know, building the best teams. So for me, as I grew in my career, I see that you know, there are very few people in the C-suite that looks like me. Mm-hmm. So that really um, propelled me to do something to change the situation. And how did then you go from saying, wow, that's, this is real. There was not a lot of people, as you said, that look like you in the C-suite too. I'm going to create this company and put it into action to pay it forward and help others or more women and women of color achieve what I've achieved. Um, you know, it's funny because it was not intentional in some <laughs> way, because I always see myself as an accidental entrepreneur. I I never, you know, being in corporate America for 20 years, I, you know, I always see myself as, you know, being an executive in the corporate setting. So, but then the idea came to me when I was mentoring students and, um, and someone asked me a question about, hey, Maggie, you you have such an amazing career. We're coaching mentors and sponsors a big part of your career growth. And I said, absolutely, all of above. And, um, and that got me the idea that I started working with my coach like 10 years ago when I was a director of marketing at Microsoft. And, you know, having a coach has been such a great asset for me to have that relationship. So I wish more women in their career would get a coach earlier in their career. That's how Tenshi was born. And one of the things that I think that has been true to me is when I think about my life and also my career, taking risks has been, you know, part of my DNA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being an entrepreneur, starting something from scratch is something I had never done, which is also a big challenge. So, which is why I'm excited to take on this challenge. You bring up a lot of good points there. And um, I want to get back to your time at Microsoft, where I think it was in the Cornell profile, which was terrific uh, in, in talking about your journey that you said you were talking with a superior at Microsoft and you were applying for a lot of these jobs internally within the company. And that person said, what do you actually want to do? How did you, uh, or how do you pass along that knowledge of helping people not just apply to everything, but focus? And Jacob, you're absolutely right. And I think this also speaks to a lot of people, especially when they're earlier in their career, Mm -hmm where you basically, you know, you work really hard to try to do a good job in your job. And then someone would tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, I would like you to, you know, work on this, or I would like you to take on this different role within the company. And, you know, you look at the role, you said, hey, this is interesting to me, so I'm going to do this. And one of the things that was very unique in that conversation when I was having with my VP at Microsoft was that he really, you know, kind of stopped me and say, you know, think about where you want to go in your long-term career and, and how do you cultivate a directional focus to get there? And that got me really thinking that, you know, because I was in marketing and I love marketing and I love being in tech and being a CMO one day was my career in North Star. Um, so, Basically, from that point forward, my career choices became very intentional. It doesn't necessarily mean that when people tap me on the shoulder, I said, no, it just means that, 
you know, when I look at roles for my next step, as well as my next, next step, I was intentional about how does it help me to get to my career North Star. And to highlight executive coaching, I think for folks not in the corporate sector, that might be an abstract concept. And obviously, uh, attention, you're focused on it, um, among other things. What goes into executive coaching? Yeah, executive coaching is really having a coach that is your thought partner. And your thought partner is really helping you to, you know, focus on the different areas in your career, whether it is helping you to focus on your career development, leadership development, as well as being a thought partner, a sounding board for, you know, any of the specific challenges that you're going through um, that you really, you know, feel like you have a safe space to discuss with someone to tackle those challenges. So for me, starting, you know, 10 years ago, working with Mary, my coach, it was really helpful in crystallizing my career aspirations, as well as my leadership skills, because throughout the time that I work with Mary, and even now, I still continue to work with Mary as, you know, as a CEO of my own company, is to really hone in on specific leadership areas that I want to focus on and also highlighting any of the blind spots that I may have as well. So, um, so which is why I really believe that everyone should have an executive coach. And you were able to, if I'm not mistaken, because I think people hear executive coach and they think that's expensive. Uh, I'm just, you know, at point A, and especially if you're early in your career, but you were able to convince the companies you were working for to help fund that and support your having an executive coach. Absolutely. And that is also why Tenshi is not only focusing on high level executive, we want to bring coaching earlier in their career as well. We have worked with organizations on sponsorship program that really combine the internal executive sponsorship together with coaching and also the peer to peer support that really help, especially women and underrepresented minorities to find their voice in, the, in their environment, whether it is a startup or all the way to a Fortune 100 company. And take me through, and I, I imagine it's been affected somewhat by the pandemic, and certainly you can highlight that as well, a day-to-day -day, uh, at Tenchi. Wow, absolutely. Uh, you know, the day-to-day, -day is it, vary, it varies. Um, whether it is, you know, I usually start off my day really planning out my day, um, looking at my calendar, seeing what are the meetings that I have. But really, um, our focus day-to-day -day is how do we really lift our mission to advance diversity in the workplace? What are the things that we can do? What are the conversations that we can have that can really continue to help women, underrepresented groups, um, all those leaders to continue to grow? And how do we help organization to be more inclusive so that it is truly becoming equality for all? And do you feel that those conversations, not just at Tenshi, but in the Fortune 500 community at large are happening more? Is there increased awareness? And what are the steps that need to be taken still? You know, the good news is that there are definitely an increase of conversations that are happening in, you know, in organizations. And in fact, four out of five CEOs in the U.S. are saying that diversity is a high priority. So, you know, so that is really good news. The thing that still need to happen, though, is that when you look at the numbers, they are still not changing that much. I mean, if you look at the McKinsey, the Lenin reports every year on women in the workplace, we still seeing roughly the same numbers, about 20% of the C-suite are women and 4% and are women of color. These numbers are still very low, you know. Staggering. We, yeah, and when we are trying to get to a 50-50, but I am hopeful that there are a lot more conversations and I really believe that organizations now really have to look at their initiatives. Like where, where are the biggest challenges and, and how do you tackle those areas? Um, the challenges I would say start out from the very early in the 
in the talent pipeline. Because even from the very first promotion, we see that even though women and men are you know, getting into the workforce at 50-50, but then starting with the first promotion, there are more men are getting promoted. So from that point forward, that we see that you know, the, the percentage continue to drop. And that is the same for underrepresented groups as well. So the question become, what are organizations doing to really increase that visibility and also development opportunities to, you know, to really level the playing field, as you will. You know, Maggie, it's really timely because we're seeing these statistics of women dropping out of the workforce due to the burdens and challenges of the pandemic. Uh, how do you see that in your space on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so it is very important for us at, at Tenshi is how do we give the support to our members, like the people that we coach, um, more support in helping them to navigate that work-life integration. And at the same time is how do organizations have really flexibility in their policy to allow workers um, and employees to really be able to take care of work life and family life as well. And there are definitely more and more organizations, you know, especially coming from the tech industry, I see that, you know, some tech companies are already thinking about, you know, how do they help their employees to also take care of you know, family time during the working hours, the traditional working hours, right? So how do you give out the flexibility time for people to work and also people to take care of, you know, not only family, but themselves as well, because the mental wellness is also very critical during this time. And Maggie, you've said in the past in male dominated industries, women have to create the space for themselves. How do they go about doing that? Absolutely. The first thing to do is make your voice heard. A lot of women tend to, you know, not speaking up in meetings and, and they always have so great um, ideas and perspective to offer. Be part of the conversation. And I can tell you, you know, I fell into that trap before too. And it was one of my, um, one of my managers earlier in my career who actually said to me, hey, Maggie, you always have some great ideas, but I don't see you speaking up in meetings. So one of the things that I actually taught myself to do was any meetings that I'm participating in, I prepared ahead of time to really focus on what are the questions, or what are the perspectives that I may wanna bring into that conversation. And then within the first 10 minutes of the meeting, I make myself to make my voice heard. And that is a way for me to build my own muscles. So, you know, making your voice heard is very important. And second is, you know, there also sometimes I hear because there are so few women in, um, you know, in executive roles, especially in male dominated industries, that sometimes, you know, there's a little voice in our head thinking, do we belong here? Like, are we here because, you know, we're the token women or we're the token, you know, people of color. And I would say to you all is, you know, you belong there because you have accomplished everything that you had. So make it so that you show up to show people what you're capable of and those voices would die down. So those are kind of the two tips that I have. And to get to your going back in time a little bit, I, I was um, really interested in reading not just your about your Binghamton career, but you came from Hong Kong to New York City at age 14, and then you end up uh, going to upstate New York in the southern tier. Take me through how you ended up at Binghamton and how your experience uh, as a Bearcat uh, affects you today. Absolutely. Um, so when when I was deciding which college, which college to go to, um, Binghamton was definitely top of my choices because of the values that you know the um, the college offers, as well as the education. Um, you know, I'm a marketer at heart, so the brand of Binghamton really stood out for me, and I was so um, fortunate to be able to be in an environment that you know I could grow. 
um, you know, from my educational um, endeavors, as well as, you know, meeting some lifelong friends as well. My college roommates from Binghamton are still my best of friends today. That's incredible. And lastly, uh, some final um, words of advice for that, especially it's an anxious time for anyone entering the job force, but for young women and women of color, they might be a senior, even a junior looking for an internship or a job. It is a challenging time, no doubt about it. The, the thing that they can do is really trying to connect with their classmates, with the, with the career service office at Binghamton and also really spend the time networking. Mm -hmm. And you know, to that point, actually someone from Binghamton who recently graduated like class of 2020 reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, Maggie, I met you on campus last year. Can I, you know, can I get on a call with you, get some advice from you? I'm like, absolutely. So I'm actually speaking with her later today. Maggie Chan Jones, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, we thank you for your continued support um, of the university and its students and wishing you continued success and good health. Thank you so much, Jacob.